Okay, dear uh, Vice President and dear honored guest, today I will give a talk. Uh, this is a bit more technical than we have just given. So the title is uh, Miniature Robotics uh, Physics Meets Automation. So maybe I just firstly explain the terminologies I'm using. Actually, this is a bit more recent term called Miniature Robotics from this EU Robotics. And traditionally, we call us uh, Micro Nano Robotics in the research field. But, uh, whether it is uh, miniature robotics or micro nano robotics, what are they? Are they just big robots that is slightly smaller and otherwise similar? Well, in some sense they are. So this is an illustration drawn over two decades ago by our early researchers. So you see the robot also have some kind of manipulator and uh, it can move around and also have, I mean, they look like robots, but it looks like smaller robots. So we are doing robots, robotics. But we are also doing it slightly differently. So it's not all about the size, but also about many other things. And for example, when we try to grasp small objects, the object will tend to adhere to the tool and in some cases, when the liquid is present, it will also try to pull the part back. And uh, so the phenomena will be very different. And this requires us to study a bit more the physics. So what are the physics? Actually, the physics is very simple. This is the illustration of the physics. So we have a cube, two cubes, a large cube and a small cube. The large cube have the length of the edge B10, let's forget about the unit, and the area of a facet B100, and the volume B1000. But if we scale down the system 10 times, we will get a unit cube with the edge B1, area B1, and the volume B1. So this is really trivial. But this actually explains what's the difference. So if you have any physical quantity that is related to the length or volume, they will become much more important than any other physical quantities related to the, uh, sorry, to the area than to the volume, like the gravity and inertia. So if we see a little bit more uh, closely to a real example, that uh, we have different forces acting at a millimeter scale on, on the uh, left and a micrometer scale on the left. At a millimeter scale, the forces are somehow closer to each other, well, the gravity is slightly smaller than the surface tension and a bit larger than other forces like electrostatic force or van der Waals force. But on the right side, at the micrometer scale, the gravity is the smallest among all forces. So it is actually only 10 millionths of the surface tension force. So therefore, we can ignore it. So at the micro world, it is also a micro gravitational world even more, there is no inertia. So in, in microgravity, you have uh, inertia, but we don't have inertia. Therefore, as a robotician, we have to study quite a bit physics to understand what the hell is going on, what is really going on is it in this uh, scale. And by studying all those physics, we are finally dealing with the problem quite differently. So you see how we handle small objects. So we, we, of course, sometimes we also use the tools that looks familiar to the big robots, tweezers, grippers, and, but also we use many other techniques that is very different. For example, we use a, a electrostatic gripper, a surface tension gripper, or ca called capri gripper, or ice gripper, and we can, by controlling the dry attention to grasp or release components, and we can use laser or light beam to control, to, to, to trap and move objects. We can use dielectric forces, this uh, kind of uh, asymmetric electric field to move objects. Of course, we can use magnetic fields and acoustic fields to move things around. So we are studying all those kind of uh, not very normal ways of moving things compared to the traditional robotics. And actually there are many more that I'm not listing here. So miniature robotics is where physics meets automation. 
we are doing robotics, but we do a lot of automation as well. So, but are they really helpful by studying this kind of uh, interdisciplinary area? So I will try to uh, give some examples to, to show how that are helpful. So firstly, I will give a few examples about how physics enhances automation. So the first problem is a very kind of uh, practical industrial problems, like integrating of microchips, uh, including make it uh, integrate circuits themselves or integrate integrate circuits to some uh, electronics. And in industry, people use a lot of robots. And the robots, they can have different kind of, the kind of vacuum gripper or something more advanced, super fast uh, kind of manipulation systems. They can manipulate parts very fast. So like one, uh, 120,000 units per hour, if you can translate something like 30 components per second. And they are very fast, but they are not very accurate. If you see the accuracy, they, curl, they are around some tens of micrometers. There's also robots that can do things very accurately, but also very slowly. So fundamentally, it is a trade-off. Can we do things very fast and very accurately? And to solve this problem, we need actually a toy. So I will show the toy. So this is a very uh, useful toy for a baby. And I don't know who has invented it. Uh, the idea is that a you know, baby can, they don't have very good motor skills. So they just take the parts and try to fit into those cavities. And it's kind of template that help the parts to fit inside. And we just can, well, borrow the ideas and uh, then do it slightly differently. Of course, we use the physical principle called the surface tension instead of the cavity. And when the uh, surface tension is uh, applied between the where the should go, the template, and a part, it will try to put there. And this process is called self-alignment. And if the parameters are right, you will get the job done pretty easily. We just throw the thing there, and it will align pretty accurately. And of course, we can integrate such process with the industry process like dispensing, part feeding, and then uh, when everything works well, then we have fundamentally a solution for this high speed and high accuracy robotic uh, assembly task. And to do this, of course, we have to study quite a bit of physics. So we have to study how to, uh, to, to confine the liquid, how to introduce the liquid, and how does the template work uh, with the alignment and uh, how inaccurately we can place the component. For example, we have to study uh, different kind of uh, wetting control ability using chemistry or use sharp edges or grooves or uh, undercuts. And if things are done right, the process can be very reliable and robust. And this pro the, 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 it will just do the very accurate assignment, uh, alignment. And uh, with this kind of uh, understanding, we have uh, integrated our technology with a, a industry partner in our EU project, FAB2ASM, where I was a coordinator. And we can achieve accurate alignment uh, at one micrometer with a speed of uh, uh, 15 chips per second. So this is a dramatic improvement compared to what industry can, uh, can do before that. And of course, uh, we can also uh, do many other things like uh, transport small objects, use microscopic rain, also do the texture manipulation like flip chips, 90 degree without a, a kind of robotic uh, rotational joints, or create overhanging structures, or install, uh, install chips accurately on soft substrate, which is a you know, soft, material, soft device is a, a very uh, important uh, uh, trend nowadays. And also we can uh, we integrate the technology into so industry de demonstrations like uh, integrate IC, IC chips onto lead frame and stack a very thin uh, lead, uh, kind of chips, 10 micrometer chips, and creating these kind of three-dimensional integrated circuits that they don't uh, not only have these horizontal uh, electric circuits, but also vertical electric connections. And of course, lasers on some substrates. And uh, Studying physics, of course, makes us also you know, have expertise in, in certain physics. And we also utilize that for example, this kind of undercut edge for confining liquid. And 
other microfluidics applications like uh, to, to control the spreading in a very deterministic way. And uh, with a little bit of automation, we can deposit uh, nanoliter droplets on substrate in a very, very fast way. This is actually slow motion, uh, 200 times slower, slower than reality. And in a very uh, controlled uh, way of deposition, which is also important for uh, many microfluidic applications. Okay, so the, I show some examples how physics combined with automation leads to very interesting results. And then I will show some also other examples about how automation enhances physics. And I will start this with a very old man, Ern Chadney, who is called the father of acoustics. Uh, he is actually a German. And at the year of 1787, he published a very important work. It's the first time showing the vibration modes on solid structures. And this is actually the beginning of the acoustic research and also all the vibration series and wave series and so on. So what he had done is he is uh, applying a bow on a piece of metal, and then when when he kind of uh, bowing it, then the particles, it was a, a lot of sands scattered. They will start to vibrate, move, and then uh, towards those nodal lines and create a pattern, so-called Chardonnay figures. So this is actually very beautiful figures. Each figure is corresponding to a certain frequency. And you can see in reality how those kind of figures can be created with the modern instruments, with a piezo actuator. And uh, you see the particle, before they settle to the nodal lines, they are actually quite chaotic. So even though they finally, they accumulate onto those lines. And, uh, but the motion actually is believed to be uh, random during the past two centuries. And uh, we also, we just started this using a bit of automation methods instead of the pure physical methods. So this shows how single particles move under the vibration. And you can see the front or back edge of the particle, they hit the surface in a quite chaotic manner. There are no real rhythms. Which one hit first, which one hit the second? And if you try to model this using physics, your first principle methods, you will not get a very, say, deterministic or understandable way of uh, how the thing should work. But if you step back a little bit, and then we will see, in general, the particles still move towards the right side. So what we do is we use our uh, data-driven modeling methods. So we played, uh, placed lots of particles on the uh, plate and then play these small pulses of the vibration and see how they work. And then we can use a, a localized least square method to model those motions and create a map. And we actually have done this for uh, 59 frequencies. And uh, if you play those uh, kind of different say, uh, 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 field in sequence in the right way, if we know when the particle is, then we will have a good control of the motion of the, of the particles. And this shows uh, the, uh, how we control the particles in the real uh, 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 kind, of, uh, kind of real life videos. And you see this is actually not a particle, it's a washer, seven millimeter size and they moved quite fast and to, uh, following a uh, quite complicated, say, trajectory. And uh, it is actually the, 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 the accuracy is quite good. And we, we can also uh, control uh, multiple particles simultaneously and independently if we play the field uh, in, in, a, in a good manner, we actually use a linear programming controller that controls the uh, uh, two objects towards the uh, their corresponding target. And by playing this sequence of music notes, we achieved also can uh, this kind of simultaneous and independent, independent control of multiple particles. And this shows some real world examples. And you can see that uh, 
the, the, actually the, the system is very simple. It's only a plate on a piezo actuator, a single actuator, single acoustic source, and we can control three particles following independently, three tra trajectories, or six particles initially randomly placed and then group them into two groups, or pattern four objects from one formation to another formation. And actually, you have to think this all that has been done with only a single actuator. This is the unprecedented, uh, say, ratio between how many motions you can control with one device. And of course, we can also do it with something more useful. Uh, for example, uh, this is a, uh, some micro droplets are loaded on two solid carriers, and they are merged together, and this is fundamentally I, I, I will create a, 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 a microfluid device that uh, can be useful for analyze of uh, 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 biomedical or, 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 or pharmaceutical uh, subsystems. And uh, besides this, of course, I briefly also show some other uh, examples how we can help physics. For example, we can use those kind of uh, miniature uh, robotics Together with uh, very high sens sensitive uh, force sensors, we can measure nanonewton level force. And for example, we can detect the coating strength of atomic layer deposition, which is nanon layer deposition on the surface or as a membrane. And also uh, to, 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 to measure the dry and wet adhesion between microparts. And also we can move very small particles, such as uh, those magnetic particles which are a few micrometer in size, and we can selectively pick them and place them very accurately. So those are also useful for uh, pharmaceutical applications. And uh, so this is about it. And uh, so what we are doing, we are developing or working, uh, building those kind of, uh, say, miniature robotic instruments. They may look like robot or may not look like robot, but uh, they are robotic instruments. And uh, uh, we use them to manipulate very small objects like biological cells, microparticles, um, microfibers, some in vivo device, droplets, uh, integrated circuits, or other kind of uh, microchips. So we can, uh, by combining physics and automation, we can do a lot. Uh, in a more deterministic way and, and with a lot of new capabilities. And uh, the impact area includes the biological, biomedical, and the microsurgery. So we can do cell manipulation in microfluidics uh, analysis, a drug response, a drug, uh, response study, uh, biomechanical uh, characterization, uh, in vivo uh, diagnosis, for example. And in material science and technology, we can use for characterization tasks like uh, for adhesion, strength, wetting, and, uh, and structure say, uh, surface properties. As well, we can do construction of test structures and specimens. And in manufacturing, of course, they are good too for integration and testing of uh, semiconductors, uh, optoelectronics, microsystems, and many other things. And fundamentally, we are aiming towards intelligent instruments that combines advanced say, uh, uh, automation, physics, and uh, some AI that hopefully we will help uh, to, to improve the efficiency and the productivity of research and the manufacturing. Thank you.